and design expert who shows forward thinking leaders how to influence work culture, drive progress and build for the future of work. He is PSA's 2016 Keynote Presenter Award for Excellence winner and he aids all who quest through complexity and transformation. We're about to have a fireside chat without the fireside, but that's okay. Uh, Jason is going to talk about how to cultivate intimacy and depth online. Thank you very much. Over to you, Jason. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, so here's my intent is that we're in the, the half hour or so that we have, I'm going to share some provocations and um, have seven points in mind. And I would love for folks, if you have any questions that come to mind, to be jotting them down in Q&A or in the chat thread, whatever works. And then I'm hoping that we can have some generous space for some banter together. I mean, if I think about um, what we've just experienced, uh, and oh, before I get into it, I'd just like to pay my respect to uh, the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet, even though we're meeting online, many of us are experiencing a much greater sense of place, uh, um, particularly here from Melbourne or Nam, as uh, COVID-19 has got us into sheltering in place. And I'd like to extend this respect and so sense of solidarity to any First Nations folks gathered here today. Um, this experience, um, you know, if I think about what we're, what we're, um, what we've, what we've kind of just been through this, this is a funny time right now. If I think about what we just experienced, there was a lot of really great information in that, but I'm almost like, gosh, imagine if um, we had seen that as kind of custom little short videos in advance, and then we had more time to, to kind of engage in an interactive, intimate, ask anything type session. And this is an important consideration for us to be contemplating as speakers because the landscape has shifted. And I would suggest that this landscape for us has shifted, was shifting quite significantly before COVID-19 became a thing. Um, we had for some time the rise of influences happen. And so um, I remember in the early days before Facebook was even a thing, just as I was beginning to join back then the National Speakers Association, and there was beautiful things about stagecraft and how we, you know, the uh, learning from the greats like Glenn Capelli, Alan Parker, Colin James, Matt Church, wondrous. And, and yet a lot of those things we don't really quite have as much access to when we're boxed in on the screen. And what's happened in the meantime is you've had the rise of the influencer. And the influencer is those that are very, very good at vlogging, at working with social media, working with search engine optimization, doing all of the things. And I would suggest it's, it's not really that wise that we try to compete against influencers. Certainly if we're not, if we're new to this, I'm certainly not very good at it, um, but we can draw inspiration from this. Um, I found this thing happening for me personally with regards to the speaking arena in that um, say my, my fees got to quite a point where um, it was quite premium. And then I noticed this thing where many conferences and events um, were much more interested at bringing influencers into the mix who couldn't necessarily speak well on stage, but in terms of gathering a, a sense of, you know, um, uh, like, um, to, to make it seem like, oh, this event, look, it's got this person, this influencer here and all that. So it kind of added to that effect. But then we also have this weird thing happening with most events nowadays where one of the key outcomes of live events this is before COVID, one of the key outcomes of live events was the, the question, how can we get trending on social media? And so you'd have events that were optimized for social media, for getting, you know, pithable statements, tweetable likes, shares, hashtags all over the place. And couple this with the fact that events were increasingly being recorded so that then social media, you know, you could cut out bits and use that as a part of a bigger strategy. What I think increasingly happened is the, the role of stagecraft, the role of holding a space an intimate, you had to be there kind of event experience uh, that was starting to get diminished. Uh, I would see that usually you would go to an event because you get to see stuff and experience stuff from people that you wouldn't normally get to experience um, via other means. But that was starting to disappear because no one could really think in draft. Everyone had to present polished thinking because you have no idea if it's going to be recorded and how long it's going to live out in the world for. And so we kind of saw this absence of, of rawness um, any vulnerability was more performative. Um, you know, here, watch me be authentic. And so I found that the industry was going into this weird place and then COVID-19 comes along 
And then here we are trying to figure out what the hell to do. Um, and I see many fellow um, speakers scrambling to get professional studios set up and to get all their things um, looking, you know, perfect. But I, I would suggest that perhaps there's a, there's a chance for us to step back and to reconsider things. I'd also suggest that um, from a societal perspective, we're seeing in many capital cities a shift from a more modern um, value set to what could be considered a more postmodern value set for, for, for as good or ill as that may be. So a modern value set, valuing grand narratives and all these big, you know, here are the seven steps to success and all of that stuff to now many folks seeing through a lot of the bullshit that gets per perpetrated and um, promulgated in this industry. Uh, TED Talks used to be cool, but uh, and the TED organizers know this, when anything becomes too popular, it becomes almost a parody of itself. So we're left here in this weird state that we're in with an opportunity to rethink, what is this, what is it? What is it we're all doing? And I would suggest that even though you have influencers out there and vloggers and all of that doing that really great stuff, I wouldn't compete against them. I wouldn't try to, you know, I wouldn't, I think this is the time for us to think less uh, as speakers about us having keynotes and content and shit that we might like, pull off the, sh sorry, not shit, stuff that we pull off the shelf to deliver to folks. And I think the inspiration to be found from the influencers is how can we share this stuff? You know, one of the things that most of us have in common here is an ability to communicate, to take complex concepts and ideas, to weave in a sense of narrative, a sense of um, uh, story and purpose and a vividness to, to learning concepts and to be able to deliver that. And that can happen uh, in video format, that can happen in many ways. And so what's next then? The question is, um, how, how can we ensure that we don't become mode locked because the product that we previously sold, a keynote, which was more than just the content itself, it was showing up on stage, it was creating that energetic shift in the uh, audience, it was the, being the saviors of a conference program where after a whole heap of heavy, dense content, we come in and then the energy and the mood is lifted. That's not really quite as applicable at the moment. Um, so. I, I, I think that the, the, the thing for us is that we need to get good at giving away content for free. We need to show up and we need to show up perhaps uh, in, in different, um, different modes. There is the performative mode, which might be more polished. This is where we deliver our stuff. This is a video thing. We can, we can film and shoot videos and prepare nice package content. But then there's another form and that's the intimate form where we're much more raw and responsive. And I suggest this form is something that is more of a thinking draft, more of a, a, a way of showing up and being completely present and attuned and responsive to the audience that we're in. And that is the thing that I think has been missing the event space for some time. And that's one of the opportunities that this COVID-19 outbreak has given us is the, the, the opportunity to reclaim a sense of intimacy. Any online session for me feels more like a breakout room. I, I'm personally loving showing up and chatting with an audience that is uh, away from the, it doesn't have the pomp, you know, the pomposity of the, the ceremony of being introduced and they read out your bio and you do all that stuff. But instead, you get a chance to share some provocations and then stay in the beautiful tension of all the questions that emerge and dance in amongst that. So I've got a few more points and then we're going to do just that. So I'm hoping, I'm, I'm in trying to be slightly provocative here. So see what questions might evoke for you, but I'm hoping that we can have some good time to play with the questions. So any time that you get an inquiry to speak at an event, um, it's always an opportunity to go deeper. Uh, it's always an opportunity to go beyond the keynote slot. And what's often happened for me when folks have asked me, um, you know, because you've got a lot of businesses and folks out there scrambling to figure out how can we keep people inspired? How can we cultivate a sense of cohesion in a now distributed team that is working remotely? How, you know, how do we, how do we have more trust in each other and sense make our way through this together? These, these are things here, but often what happens is they bring the default model of the past and they try to recreate uh, what used to be an, an in-person event, they try to recreate it online and it simply looks like here, we'll have a session here with some Q&A and another session here, Q&A and thanks very much and see you guys next week or whatever it is. I suggest that anytime someone's trying to, to gather people 
in an online fashion. It's, a, it's an opportunity for you to actually start to work with the client and ask them you know, questions like, what do you want people to think, feel, and do differently as a result of this? And usually that's, I mean, that's my, one of my standard NAF, you know, trinity of questions there, but it's such a gateway into a much deeper and richer conversation. What do we want people to think, feel, and do differently? And it might be that that helps to reveal, okay, well, if, 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 if that's what we want people to think, feel, and do differently, maybe it makes sense that, you know, we could do, you know, we can always just, I can show up and we can do a keynote, but, but maybe, maybe here's what we could do. Why don't we do a bit of a poll survey? We get a sense of what's on people's minds. I'll then create a custom video, a short custom video, about 20 minutes long, kind of addressing some of these things here. Uh, and then we're going to meet in person. So people have had a chance to kind of think about their questions to go a little bit deeper and then we're going to meet and you know for the hour session or whatever it is we're going to play with the questions that emerge and i'll make myself and i'll share all the resources and i'll make myself as fully present and useful as i can and we can see what might emerge i think that could be useful and so how this is manifested in my own world is uh via a fireside chat and a fireside chat to me <clears throat> Well, that, you know, to me, it evokes images of, you know, sitting under the stars by the fire and kind of letting a conversation take whatever path it will. Um, one of my most, um, uh, like my, my, you know, like all of us, my, my revenue's taken a hit, but I, I find, you know, we're quite lucky in that my, our expenses can be kept quite low. So really it's personally feeling like a sabbatical at the moment as we reconfigure what's emerging and how to best orientate for the future that we find ourselves in. But I, I find myself helping clients do online offsites. So they were originally going to gather people together to, for a strategic or a leadership offsite. And now they're thinking, how can we do this online? And yes, there's a bunch of, you know, different programs and tools and whiteboards and various mechanisms for interaction. But one of the things that events mostly miss uh, online events is, is the generative, generative ambiguity that happens in between the sessions. And we all know this, you, you go to a conference, sometimes it's, it's the magic that happens between the sessions that's more powerful than the actual content itself. You know, it's the conversations in the corridor, it's the time spent percolating music, it's the completely random serendipitous emergent conversation that happens between the fixed sessions. And that's something that, uh, as I try to do a fireside chat, that's something that I try to capture and create and, and kind of to hold a, a space of generative ambiguity for, for my clients. And so what it looks like is um, something that happens in the middle of an online event and by an on, usually with these online offsites, it's something that we design to be over a few days. Um, there's something quite powerful in that. Uh, I also think that online events allows a greater diversity of inputs. So a lot of, um, more introverted folk that have quite um, maybe have quite a few things to say are finding more comfort in, in, in engaging with the chat window. Um, but at some point in the middle, we try to recreate the scenario of what it's like when you're staying up late after, you know, at the bar at a conference and there are the conversations that are happening between folks. And how I've done this is it's kind of like a Zoom call where you can see every single person in gallery view. Part of the thing about a fireside chat is there's a no hierarchy and we try to engage it in a spirit of improvisation. So we're looking to build upon previous thoughts and answers to do a lot of yes ends rather than critique or try to be right. There's a wonderful quote by Marshall Rosenberg, the um, pioneer of nonviolent communication. He says, um, there are two games that we can play in life. Um, the first is the game of who's right. It's a game in which everyone loses. Uh, and the second game is the game of making life wonderful. And a fireside chat is about making life wonderful. It's not about debate, it's not about dialectics, it's about making life wonderful. And I've found that, I don't know, most of us here will attend a lot of events. Most of us here will probably be coping abreast of a lot of emerging things. And there is a wit that many speakers have, if we're not too narcissistically obsessed with their own stuff and we're actually paying attention to what's happening in the world, there's a kind of wit that we can bring to events. And by wit, I'm talking about associative knowledge, the ability to tap into disparate things and to synthesize it in the moment um, so as to evoke a kind of insight. And 
making yourself like thinking it's okay, cool. You got a keynote, but thinking about what that might be as we expand it out into an online experience to deepen the sense of intimacy and connection and value that your clients get maybe a fireside chat or something like that could be useful. I've got one more point uh, and then we'll open up to some Q and a, uh, and this is really just a suggestion that we think beyond the paradigm. The trend I see right now is everyone's flexing into, oh shit, what studio lights do I get? What microphone do I get? How do I get a green screen or a backdrop? And you know, that's, there's some kind of fundamental hygiene elements there, but there is a bit of zoom fatigue happening. There is a lot of online events happening right now. And to think of, uh, think of our business models of, of, as us selling keynotes, I'm, I'm not so sure how, uh, lucrative that pathway is going to be in this new world. And I think it's going to take some time for the world to recover and for uh, large events and gatherings to be what they perhaps once were. But I do think there's an opportunity for the, the skills uh, that we have and for the way that we show up for us to be thinking, okay, well, if everyone's going to be doing that, well, if most people are going to be, you know, going super professional, schmick studio setups, lots of online events, what's going to happen maybe six months after that? What do we anticipate, you know, will be missing? What will be the emerging needs in the market? And how can you start positioning yourself for the world that we're going to be living into in six months time or beyond, rather than hustling too hardcore for, you know, just um, getting some, some revenue in right now. That's kind of where my mind is. And my sense of things are that there, there's an hygiene component in terms of we need to be technically ready for a lot of this stuff, but I do feel as though the, the ability to hold generative ambiguity and intimate tension within paradox and to hold, like to, to kind of deliver value in a non-performative manner where everything's become so polished and preened for the social media and the masses. I think that's going to be a pocket of meaningful work that we can reclaim as speakers. And so with that, I'm, I'm super curious as to what questions have emerged. I've learned to not look at the chat thread whilst I'm speaking, because otherwise I get too distracted. I'm going to pause and glance at that now, but um, Gary, if you want to jump in or if anything come to your mind, um, please feel free to do so. Yes, thank you, Jason. Uh, amazing stuff. Um, I have been looking at the chat box. Um, there are less questions than there are uh, praiseworthy comments for uh, particularly some of the concepts that you are um, talking about here. Um, one here yes, from uh, Colin James, facilitation of conversation seems to be the core skill for speakers, letting go of the performance and the script. Mm. Uh, you've clearly been talking about that. Can you, uh, can you elaborate on that a little further? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, <laughs> a lot of the foundational stuff from this was, was things that I learned from Colin. Um, uh, and I, I just had this flashback of being in a masterclass that Colin did with uh, national speakers over in WA when I, back when I used to live there. There was a large number of us in the room as, as Colin was, um, I, you know, I do miss that, you know, that the, when, when we go into the facilitator mode and you've got this acuity for what's emerging in the room and, and, and to, be, to be able to be able to re, um, responsive to what emerges and to hold all those tensions, it's, it's a different setup for us right now. And there are some mechanisms that we need to get good at with regards to the tools that we have. I've had to do some events with Microsoft Teams via Mac and it's, it's sometimes it's a little bit trickier to get the gallery vo uh, view up and happening. I do like Zoom and how we can see people. But one of the things I would often do with a more conversational session is, is by making sure that we can see what's going on. So we have gallery view here and there's, there's, there's a subtle shift and sorry if I'm going off track here um, with Colin's um, uh, comment here, but I've, I've learned to shift my sense of, um, I'm playing with the term keynote provocateur. It's a little bit wanky, um, which I don't mind, by the way, I like wanky stuff. I'm, I'm the type of person that when, you know, encounter tasting notes, I, I love it to be as vivid and as far out there imaginative as I can. But a keynote provocateur, our, our, our purpose in an organization, if we're to show up, our purpose as a speaker is to provoke, is to provide new metaphors and new ways of seeing things so that people can open up new ways of you know, new, new, so that we can open up new possibilities beyond the default. 
that's kind of one of the main things why people bring in external speakers. And so to show up, to be a bit of a provocateur, to kind of stir things up, but then to be present in a generative and abundant and warm and encouraging and enthusiastic way to hold the conversation. I think that's, that's a good direction for us to head into. Yeah, that's a fascinating way of looking at it. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions here. Um, uh, a, flipped, a flipped learning from Paula Smith, a flipped learning model is a powerful way for better engagement and learning. Are your fireside chats based on this, Jason? I haven't actually formalized any of that, but the, the sensibilities are very, of the flipped classroom is very apt for us. And so if essentially the flipped classroom um, is the notion that you, uh, what is it? You do the learning at home and then you do the homework together. And I think that, um, I mean, one of the, there's, there's new mechanisms for us. Um, I consider all technology a kind of magic. So where the, the, it still baffles me the fact that we're doing this right now, that somehow through the techno magic, uh, we are able to communicate and share this space together. And I think sometimes we can lose that sense of enchantment. But if we tap into that, one of the forms that I'm seeing that I haven't personally played with much yet is the idea that we now live in a world where we can have a digital double. And by that is you can, you can show up to a live event and give the event organizers your talk that you've recorded. And then you can actually be in the room and the chat window and all that with the participants while your digital version of you from your past self is delivering your presentation. And I think there's something beautiful about uh, merging, you know, uh, cool. We've got the content. We're going to go and, presenter mode, but whilst, you know, you're in presenter mode on screen, you're in the chat thread and you're responding in real time to the questions that emerge uh, rather than waiting for the q and I don't know. There's some, there's, some new, there's some new forms for us to play with in this space um, that I think can be quite fun. But yes, the flipped classroom, I think, is a very, um, very apt metaphor, a very apt thing for us to be thinking about. Uh, that's a fascinating idea. I really like that idea of uh, the digital double uh, commenting on your own self. I think that's a very interesting. Yeah. And cringing at yourself too. And <laughs> kind of like there's, I think there's a nice kind of, we need to make sure like, I think narcissism is a big threat in our industry. Uh, and with, with regards to personal branding, we can become very self-obsessed, but to be able to be there in the room and to kind of, take the piss out of yourself whilst you're on screen. I don't know. I think it's, there's something quite leveling and humanizing about it, which I think is good. Yeah, I like it. A very specific question, Jason, from, uh, from Marie Claire Ross. Are there, any other, are there any specific questions that you like to use to provoke thinking? Yeah, totally. Um, one of my most favorite questions, um, particularly when... Okay, so yeah, there's a little context for this. Um, my, my experience with most corporate events is there's this weird kind of forced jolliness or cheerfulness where I, had, like, I was just talking with a client this morning who in the registration process, I, I suggested to him, you know what would be cool? It's like, just get people to think like, you know, share, like what's one word to describe the, their, their mood or their vibe? Or what's one word to describe um, their sense of the team culture right now? And I expected that in the poll survey, people would put up, you know, any word that comes to mind and that'll be interesting qualitative feedback. But what the organizers did instead was they gave a choice of here's 12 words, strategic, innovative, leadership, um, collaborative. They just chose a whole bunch of, you know, buzzwords that sounded good. And this, this seems to happen in a lot of corporate events where there's this veneer that we must present. Everything's perfect and everything's good. And so sometimes when I'm, in an event like that, and I see that everything's looking good and everyone's just towing the line, it's nice to ask the question, all right, what are we pretending to not know? <laughs> and it's something that, you know, it requires a fair bit of padding out that question. What are we pretending to not know? And sometimes I'll preface that by, by actually just calling out what's happening. As you know what happens, we come to these events and we, there's kind of like a fairly set script to these things and we're all nodding along, but many of us are having these other thoughts that, that are thinking, yeah, but we're not talking about this. We haven't addressed that. And it's just nice to be able to create a space. I mean, you have to, this is where the facilitation savvy is so important, where we create a sense of psychological safety, where we ask ourselves the question, do we really need to record this session? 
maybe there's a chance that we can allow each other to think in draft and to explore some of these more challenging or wickedly complex um, dilemmas with a little bit more deafness and nuance and um, gentleness and warmth. I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, what are we pretending to not know is, uh, is one of my favorite questions. Um, I also like asking the distinction between what is meaningful progress and what is the delusion of progress? Um, and many people are quick to point out the many things that they're doing at work that could be considered a rich delusion of progress. And that usually spurs a nice kind of constructive discontent for further conversations. I love it, Jason, that's very good. Uh, one, one question that occurs to me, and, and I guess uh, in, in this uh, online world that we are navigating right now, uh, the idea of the keynote as the, f as the, as the finished product, um, yeah. Clients, I guess, have a certain expectation of when they, you know, watch a keynote. How do we manage those expectations? Do you do that on the day or is there something that we should be doing to kind of set up different expectations for clients right now? That's a great question. And I think, I think it's going to, uh, we all need to, uh, like, there are myriad different types of keynotes. So, um, you know, th there are some folks that have beautiful inspirational stories that have uh, rich emotional arcs built into it that that work in it when delivered in that particular way. Um, having said that, if those same folks have that exact same keynote available to watch on YouTube, I question it's it's a it's a tricky one. Uh, it's something that we all need to ask. I've I've taken the stance of knowing that um, most people in an event will rock up with a prepared presentation. Uh, it's a lot more, you know, there's a lot more anxiety and apprehension to dance in the generative ambiguity. I call it, and I might have got this from um, Colin James, um, I've always thought of it as being prepared to wing it. And by being prepared to wing it, I mean, wing it you, you're actually doing a lot of the preparation work. You're actually anticipating and sensing and, and kind of, um, the, it, it doesn't translate to scripted content, but you're, you're, you're prepared to wing it. So when you show up, you're, you can go with what emerges. Um, but that's not everyone's cup of tea. And so there is a question to think, okay, well, what's, what's the, what's some unique strengths that I can flex into in this new world that we find ourselves in? Yeah. Uh, good question here from Lauren Hancock, uh, Jason. I love the idea of bringing back the vulnerability and spontaneity to sessions. What sort of aha moments are your clients reporting and are these different than pre-COVID? Um, yeah, yeah, this is a good question. It's, um, I'm finding that, okay, so, so when it comes to vulnerability, I, I think vulnerability, that, that word almost became, look, you know, here's, here's me being vulnerable and the vulnerability became a prepared act that <laughs> people performed so as to not be vulnerable. Um, uh, I, I think that um, one of the things that, uh, you know, so, so in any good event, you'd want to have a, an, a, a very wondrous panel session where, because most folks are wanting to know, and I'm, 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 I have a bias here to working in um, corporate environments with, um, with those strategies going on. But, uh, you know, with a panel session, um, what you want to be able to demonstrate here is that you, you, you want to kind of um, live into the naivety. So you want to be able to, demonstrate naivety, ask questions, demonstrate that you don't know, have all the answers because it gives confidence to other folks to ask those questions. You also do this subtle thing of, um, you know, part of the charm of external speaker is that we can be blind to the hierarchy at play. So sometimes that means managing some of the power dynamics. Um, and I'm just finding that, uh, I'm just finding that the, the playing field is so much more level in this, this COVID time because you're looking at things that emerge in the chat window and that might be from, you know, uh, someone who is a graduate who's only been with the company for a few months that in a normal live session probably wouldn't dare speak that, but in a chat thread it's, it's coming up fine and you can surface that and play with what emerges more so than perhaps we could have in the past. Um, so hopefully that's a, I, I don't know if I answered the question, but um, it's a good question. Yeah, no, sounds good. Um, and possibly the last question, Jason, one from David Penglaze here. Uh, do okay. you believe that natural, authentic, wise thinking in draft and holding vulnerable conversations is teachable and learnable? And I will add to that, and if so, how? 
Yeah, great question, um, David. Yeah, well, yeah, beautiful question. All right, so um, here's a link for you guys. Um, one of the most inspiring things that I came across uh, maybe about three years ago, uh, I was going through a bit of a dark patch myself, um, just questioning what am I doing in life and my dad had passed away and a whole heap of things, but I went to a site called meaningness.com. So meaning plus N E S S meaningness.com. And this, this is a hypertext meta book. It's essentially a book on cultivating meta rationality. Meta rationality is something that goes beyond rationality, but it's a, a means of almost like, I guess it's related to meta systemic. It's a means of being able to, see beyond the confines of, uh, I, I can't quite describe it in succinct forms, but I, I believe it is teachable. Um, this, this things, I, sorry, I believe it is learnable. I'm not sure how effective the teaching is. The teaching is often like riddles and different contexts for us to find ourselves and play within. And I don't know how linear the pathway to learning it is. Um, uh, but these are the things that can be accrued. You know, I kind of miss, the, the form of the apprentice and the master that, you know, it, what we used to have um, in the days gone. Where I remember I first started and uh, my PhD supervisor you know, got me into professional speakers. I, and I was kind of like a protege. And um, I don't know, I find that these days there's so many hacks and quick tips and how do we do all this stuff there's, that I kind of learn and just becomes superficial. But, you know, if, if one's willing to invest in the time, I, my friend, Tim Longhurst, I know has gone and studied with, um, say, um, John, uh, Grinder, no, Michael, Michael Grinder, non but there's, there's plenty of folks out there. So yeah, so long story, long rambling answer short. Yes, it's possible, but of course it's hard work. And that's the thing that most of us want to avoid. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you, Jason. And I'm going to squeeze in one last question. Um, uh, we have all during the COVID crisis, uh, been thinking that, you know, we like the certainty and we, and we hate the uncertainty of this environment. And so I guess there's a kind of a natural gravitation to wanting to know the answer to something. Um, so and I, I guess that kind of works against us a bit. Um, but we've got a question here from Leanne Wall, who said that she asked, was asked this question by a client of hers the other day. Uh, when you're doing something virtually, can you get that pin drop moment that you get in a keynote? That clear clarity, you could hear a pin drop type of moment. How can you do that? Is that a possible thing? Is it something that we should aim for? It's a beautiful thing to aim for because that's a, it's a lovely sublime thing. And I would say, yes, there's probably some folks that can do that. Um, there are many factors that will contribute to that. Obviously making sure that your ethernet cord is plugged in and you don't have any of the technical hiccups that would otherwise distract from that beautiful, you know, that beautiful sublime thing, but, um, but I dare say it would be a kind, it would be harder. Um, my partner, Kim, um, is an illustrator and an artist, and I've been seeing her join a lot of Zoom calls with poets, and these are kind of impromptu organized things by different artists, as people, different poets do different recitals, and, um, and it's, it's, this, there is a subtle and sublime magic that, I think the more that we can be open to that and the more that we can get out of sight of the, the normal kind of business mode that we find ourselves in, the more likely we might be able to come across the glimmers that uh, could be the ins glimmers of inspiration that we might be able to, you know, sublimate into something. Yeah. Maybe we find them rather than able to create them ourselves. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Jason, uh, we could go on forever, but we really appreciate your time today. Thank you very much for these fantastic insights. You're getting uh, so a lot of great feedback in the chat box. I would encourage you to have a look at that. Um, so uh, we Thanks really everyone. think it's